going to start there in verse number 7. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And so right there, the Bible says that it's the law of the Lord. It's perfect. Talking about the Word of God. And then it says that the, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. It says the law of the Lord is perfect. It says converting the soul. It's a big part. Go back to Psalm uh, chapter number 12 real fast. <coughs> Psalm 12, just a couple pages back. Verse 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The, the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Now, what I'm going to be talking about is the Word of God and its relation to uh, salvation, its relation to soul winning. And stuff like that. First of all, though, go in your Bibles to Luke chapter number 8. Luke chapter number 8. I just want to set a little foundation on how important it is that we have a perfect word of God, like it says in Psalm 19. That, that God has preserved his words, like it says in Psalm chapter number 12. Now, we have people here that probably, they, they've heard, a, you know, they know that the King James Bible is the word of God. They've heard it a lot. And they've, you know, to them... A lot of this might not be anything new, but we do have people in here that might not know some of this. And we all need to be grounded. We all need to be settled and, and established on the Word of God. And especially on the importance of the King James Bible being the perfect Word of God. Why is it so important? Why do we fight for a Bible to say that our Bible is perfect and true and all the other Bibles are perverted? What's the big deal? Number one, uh, what I'm going to show you why it's a big deal, then I'm going to get into some other aspects of it, and how the NIV is attacking certain things about the Bible, is the Bible, it's very clear that we need the Word of God to be saved. Look at verse number four. <clears throat> this is the parable of the sower and the seed. It says, And when much people were gathered together, they were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went forth to sow in his seed, went to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he, said unto, and he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but unto others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that, that hear, then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their heart, lest they should believe and be saved. So right there in one of the most famous parables, and probably one of my favorite parables in all the Gospels, is the parable of the sower and the seed. There's so many different applications that you can make with it. But the primary application is talking about salvation and people that receive the Word of God, and some of them that bear fruit, and some of them that are productive, and others that, that, that receive the Word and they're saved, but they bear no fruit. And then also the guy that does not get saved, and how come he did not get saved. And it's saying right there that the seed that it's talking about the sower that's sowing the seed, the seed is the Word of God. Now, the Word of God is the Bible. The Word of God is Scriptures. Go to John chapter number 3. The Bible is likened, very often it's likened to a seed. Okay? Now, in Psalm 126, 6, it says, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaths with them. Okay? And right there, the Bible, again, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's likened unto a seed. Okay, now look at John 3, verse 3. It says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, this is Jesus talking to Nicodemus, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? <laughs> Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of, of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which are born of flesh is flesh, and that which are born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. So right there, Jesus Christ is saying, like, in order for somebody to be saved, to see the kingdom of God, they have to be born again. Okay, Nicodemus says, well, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? 
He's saying, no, the first birth is a physical birth from your mother's womb. The second birth is a spiritual birth that's not from water, but it's a spiritual birth that comes from the Spirit. It's talking about being born again. Now, in order for there to be a first birth, there has to be a seed. Okay? All of our children that were born is from the seed from the man, and then it plants in the woman, and the baby is created. You can't have a baby cannot be born without some kind of seed from some man, whether it's a husband, wife, or whether, even if they they make it in a test tube in some you know science lab somewhere. There has to be a seed from a man implanted in the egg of a woman. It's something like, am I right? Can get some nod heads from some ladies? I'm not, that, that's close, okay. But there has to be a seed from a man, okay. Now let me say this: the second birth is exactly the same. There has to be a seed. If there's no seed. There's, there's no way it can be born. The reason why Onan was killed, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can go and read it. I think it's in Genesis 38. Onan was killed because he spilled the seed on the ground. And the reason why he spilled the seed on the ground is because he didn't want to have a baby with Tamar. Okay? Now, because he knew that without the seed, there's no baby. <coughs> now, the same thing, that's in a, a natural realm. But in a spiritual realm, there has, go to 1 Peter chapter number 1. In a spiritual realm, the same thing has to happen. There has to be a seed. And the Bible is saying that the Word of God is the seed. Now, if you go and you ask anybody, what is the Word of God? Like, what's the Word of God? What does that mean? They're going to tell you the Word of God is the Bible. Whether they believe the Bible is true or not, that's another question for, you know, down the road. But I'll say this. Everybody knows that the Word of God is the Bible. Okay? Now, in James 1, verse 18, it says, And of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creature. So right there he's saying, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. Now I begot my, begat my son with my own seed, okay? The Bible says that we are begotten with the word of truth. The word, this is the word of truth, that we should be a kind of the first fruits of his creatures, of the, okay? Now look at 1 Peter 1.23. It says, being born again, not of corruptible seed. So again, it's talking about the term of being born again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is the flower of grass. The, gla the grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. This is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians 15. So right there he's saying we're born again, not of a corruptible seed. You know, the parable of the sower, the seed is the word of God. The Bible talks about very precious seed. And then in John chapter 3, it talks about being born again. And it gives us more enlightenment in 1 Peter 2, 1 23 about being born again of what? Being born again of a seed. Now it's saying right there, and God knows there's two different kinds of seeds. There's a corruptible seed and there's an incorruptible seed. And he says, not by corruptible, but by incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Amen. Now, it makes total sense that if the seed, the Word of God, is incorruptible and can't be done away with, that our salvation would be eternal and it, we can never lose it. It just makes total sense. That's why we're born of incorruptible seed. Because we have a salvation that's completely incorruptible, not based upon how good we live from, from the day that we get saved to the time forth. It's an incorruptible salvation because it comes from an incorruptible seed, the Word of God. Now... In John 5.24, I'll read it. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. In order for there to be a first birth, there must also be a seed. And the second birth is the same. There needs to be a seed. And the Bible's clear that the seed is the word of God. Now, the Bible says, that, Now, some people say that all you need to hear is the truth of the gospel. Okay? I watched a YouTube video this week, and it was, I think it was James White. And he was talking about King James, you know, going against King James onlyism, and how that we believe that you know people that preach that you need the King James Bible to be saved, and without the King James Bible you can't be saved. I'm telling you this: the Bible saying that you need the Word of God. That's clear. There's no way around that. He agrees that the Bible says that. But what he says, when it says that, it just means that you need the truth of the gospel. You see, like the gospel, the elements, the truth that comes from it. Okay, well, let's take that phrase, the truth of the gospel. In John 17, 17, the Bible says, Jesus says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So the word, the truth, is the word of God. 
Now, 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, how all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, look at this, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again on the third day, according to the Scriptures. God is very methodical about how He places words, and He words things in the Bible. There's nothing in there that's just by coincidence or just by chance. He could have said how that Christ died for our sins, and that He was buried, and that He rose again on the third day, but He made sure that He threw in there according to the Scriptures. The reason why is because we need the Scriptures we need the Word of God to be saved. Now go to Mark chapter number 16. Now the Bible's clear that you need the Word of God to be saved. Now in Psalm chapter number 12, the Bible says that we uh, that God has preserved us. Okay, I'm going to go back there real quick and read it real fast because I, I don't want to misquote it. Go to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter number 16. Now in Psalm chapter 12, where we read, it says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, Purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation and forever. Now this is the this is the thing. We know that God's a great God. He created everything. He spoke his word and he created the entire universe into existence. Okay? I don't think the question is, is it possible? Can God preserve his words and it can God make today in 2015 a Bible that's a perfect word of God? Is it possible for God? Most people say absolutely it's possible. I mean, he's God. He can do what he wants. The question is, did he do it? Because if it's possible for him to do it, being the almighty God that he is, and he said that he would do it in Psalm chapter 12, he said that he would do it in other places in the Bible about preserving his word. If he said he would do it and it's possible for him to do it, then he must have done it because that's what he said. The Bible says that God cannot lie. The Bible says in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. The Bible says it in, uh, in I think in uh, Hebrews chapter 5 that it's impossible for God to lie. So if God said that he would keep them, then we need to believe that today there is a word of God on this earth. Now we believe it's the King James Bible. Other people, there's only three stances you can take. You can say the King James Bible is the word of God. You can say one of these other Bibles are the word of God and the King James is not. Or you can say none of them are the word of God which is the stance that most people take. Usually, if somebody does not believe the King James Bible is the Word of God, they don't believe any Bible is the Word of God, in the sense of it being perfect, inerrant, and preserved. And what they'll say is that, that they're all the same, words don't matter, You know that all the Bibles are almost exactly the same, they're just a little bit, or tweaked a little bit, and some are from different manuscripts. Now I'm going to show you this. The devil has used the NIV, and that's mainly what I'm going after tonight, is the NIV to attack so many. What's the biggest one of his, the, the one of the biggest uh, things that we have at this church that, that one of my missions in coming to Fort Worth is to go out and preach the gospel and get a bunch of people saved and, and have a place that when those people get saved, if they want, we can get them here, they can come here and they can grow in the Lord. And my goal is to, to get as many people saved as we possibly can. And the devil knows that. The devil knows that if he can get a church to stop getting people saved, that he's, it's a huge victory for the devil. The devil has used the NIV to attack soul winning. Now look at Mark 16, verse 15. Point number one, the NIV attacks soul winning by destroying the command where God tells us to go out. Look at verse number 15. It says, And he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, Jesus Christ is speaking to his own said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, that's a command not just for the disciples, but that's a command for us today too, is that we are to go out. It was not possible for all these guys to go into the entire globe and preach the gospel. It's a, it's a continuing thing. Just like when he tells Noah, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, and he tells all these people to do that, it wasn't something that they could even do. It's, he spoke the words knowing they'd be written in Scripture for everybody else here on out to hear, and it's a command not just for these guys, but for everybody else. Now, I'm going to read for you the note in every NIV, even if you go to Bible Gateway and you just look up NIV Bible and you just go to Mark 16, in between verses 8 and verses 9, this is what it says. It's not a footnote. If you're reading in the NIV, 
And you're reading right there, in like, let's say this is Mark 16. It'll stop you, and there'll be a big space, and then right in the middle, this is what it'll say. The earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have verses 9 through 20. So the NIV is telling you that in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, where the command is to go and preach the gospel to the, the whole world, that that, that that verse isn't even supposed to be there. They'll put it in there because they know that it's in a lot of other Bible versions. They know it's in the King James Bible, but they only put it in there. That's the only reason why. Now what's weird is the NIV Bible is missing 16 complete verses out of the Bible, and then other verses, another verse, it's almost completely chopped out of the Bible. I wonder why they didn't just take out Mark 16. So right there, the NIV is taking away. If you have an NIV and that's all you use, you're going to get to Mark 16. You're going to read that note. And if you decide, you know, should I go soul winning? Should I go out there and preach the gospel? According to the NIV and other ancient witnesses, which are not here, which sounds like a bunch of baloney, they're saying that those verses shouldn't even be in the Bible. Now, go to Ephesians chapter number 4. Go to Ephesians chapter number 4. Look at verse number 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints and for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Right there, the reason why that God gave a church pastors and teachers and prophets is for the edification of the saints so the people, the, the believers, can be edified and built up. What are they supposed to be built up on? The Bible says they're supposed to be built on the Word of God. Now, I want to know this. These guys that are like, I use James White because he's a good example of it, but it's a lot more people than him. Why are they, what's their purpose in telling their congregations that all these, about naming all the inerrancies in all these Bibles? Why would you even do that? Why would you tell people that they can't, what you're doing is you're telling them they can't trust their Bible. That when they're reading their Bible, that there are things in their Bible that are flawed, there are things that are, why would you do that? Let's say, for instance, that that was the case, okay? I'm over here and I believe that the King James Bible is perfect, it's the Word of God. When you come here, I'm going to give you information so that way when you read your Bible and you make choices, you know, based upon what the words say, you can have confidence that you're pleasing God because you're doing it based upon the Bible and not based upon my own opinion. Now this guy over here, he says that there's that it's all messed up. Not just the King James, but the NIVs and all these other Bibles are messed up. Now, let's say, for instance, he was right. And let's say we both die and we both stand in front of God. And we're both right in front of God. And I, you know, I'm explaining it. Says, in my ministry, Lord, is to make sure that when people read your words... They obeyed your words because they could trust that the words were true. This guy, his whole ministry is to show people that when they read the English Bible versions, whatever version it may be, it might be true and it might not. How is he building anybody up in the faith? The Bible says the prophet and the pastor and the teacher is supposed to build people up and what he's doing is he's tearing down. To having people doubt the word of God, is that of God or is that of the devil? It's of the devil. Go in your Bibles to Luke chapter number 9. Luke chapter number 9. So the NIV is telling you in Mark chapter 16 that the verse telling us to go out to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature is not even supposed to be there. Go to Luke chapter number 9. I'll read it out in the King James Bible and then I'll read it in the NIV. The Bible says, look at this. What was the purpose of Jesus Christ being here in the first place? He came, the Bible says, in, well, in Matthew 18, I'll read it for you, verse 11. For the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. That's one of the 16 verses that is not in the NIV. It's completely gone. In the NIV, it goes Matthew 18, 10, Matthew 18, 12. Verse number 11 is just completely gone. Look at Luke 9. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. In Luke 9, verse 56, in the, in the NIV, it says, Then he and his disciples went into another village. Luke 9, 56. The part where it says, For the Son of Man has not come to, to destroy men's lives, but to save them, is completely gone in the NIV. You say, well, 16 verses, that's not many verses. There are so many verses where the, like the important parts, the meat of the verse, 
is completely gone. And the NIV just says, then he and the disciples went to another village. And, and, and the King James it explains why he's going into another village. He's not coming to destroy his lives. He's coming to save them, and he's going into another village. Go in your Bibles to Matthew chapter number 28. Matthew chapter number 28. So the Bible is saying right there that it's attacking the purpose of going out. It's attacking the, 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 the command to go into the world to preach the gospel to every creature. It's attacking the purpose that Jesus had when he says that the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. It's not in the, in the NIV. And I'm just going to say the NIV, in pretty much almost every other Bible version, it's not in all those either. You can look them up in the American Standard Version and the New Living Translation. They're all, they're not, it's not there as well. They all claim to be you know, independent uh, translations of like the Greek manuscripts. But a lot of them, like the NIV uses really weird words that aren't like common English words. They're just very weird. But those same odd words are used in like every Bible translation. It's almost like they took, mm -hmm. like the NIV and the New Living Translation, they wanted to like make their own or some other perversion of the Bible. And so they just took the NIV and it's like they copy, cut, and pasted it and then just switched just enough around so it wasn't exactly the same because they're, it's a copyright. Now, the King James Bible is not copyrighted. I can print it off on my computer. A friend of mine, Richard Miller, his Bible is actually, he literally just copy, cut, and pasted it, and he printed it off, and he binded it up himself. He's got this, it's like this big, but it's like really thick, and it's like computer paper, not like this paper, so it's like super duper thick, and he made his own Bible. You can make those and sell those, and nobody can say nothing, because the King James Bible is not copyrighted. The NIV and all these other Bibles, they're copyrighted, and that's, that's the way it is. Now look at Matthew chapter number 28. It attacks the purpose of going out. It attacks the, the reason why we're supposed to go out. Now, Matthew 28, verse 18, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. Now, right there... <clears throat> He's telling people that he's telling the disciples to do three things. Number one, he's saying, "Go therefore and teach all nations." Number one. Number two, he's telling them to baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And number three, he says, "Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you." It's obvious just based upon the context when he says, "Go and teach all nations," and it's right before baptism. He's talking about teaching people how to be saved. He's talking about preaching the gospel and getting people saved. Now, look at the NIV. Oh, you can't look at the NIV, but listen. Look down at Matthew number uh, twenty-eight, verse nineteen. It says. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, in the, in the King James Bible, it says teach all nations. In the NIV, it's telling you to make disciples of all nations. You say, what's a disciple? A disciple, go in your Bibles to John chapter number 8. Being saved and being a disciple are two totally different things. There are many saved people that are just as saved as I am saved, they're just as saved as the Apostle Paul, they're just as saved as the Apostle Peter, they're just as saved as anybody else that's ever been saved, but they are not a disciple. This is the definition of what it means to be a disciple. A disciple means to, that you are a follower of Jesus Christ, that you follow His teachings. Okay. Now, in John 8.31, Jesus said unto those Jews which believed on Him, If ye continue in My word, then are you My disciples indeed. If we continue in serving Jesus after we get saved, then we indeed become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Go to John chapter number 12. Go to John chapter number 12. You say, no, if you, you know, if you, you know, if you get saved, that makes you a disciple. No. Because if you get saved, you're saved. Just because you're a disciple does not mean that you're saved. And I'll prove it to you. Because the Bible calls Judas Iscariot a disciple. Was Judas Iscariot saved? No, he wasn't. Look at verse number 4. John 12, 4. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Now go back to John chapter number 6. Go back to John chapter number 6. The Bible says that Judas was called a disciple. I mean, the narrator of the Bible said that Judas was a disciple. Why was he a disciple? Because he followed the teachings of Jesus Christ. He did what he was told. He didn't believe any of it. He did not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't put his faith in Christ, but he did what he was trying to do. There's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of religions that they try to follow the teachings of the Bible, and they would, I would even consider them. If Judas was a disciple, then they would be disciples of Christ, but you know what? They're going to burn in hell because they didn't put their faith in Christ. Look at John 6, verse 7. You say, no, Judas, 
He was saved. He lost his salvation. Look at verse number 70. Jesus answered them, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Luke chapter number 6, verse 13. You go to Romans chapter number 10. When it was day, he called on him his disciples, and of them chose he twelve, whom he also named apostles. So even though Judas was not saved, he was called a disciple. Why? Because he did what he was told to do. What does it mean to be a disciple? It comes from the same word as being disciplined and to having, being, doing what you're told to do. He was also called an apostle. You say, no, he wasn't a real apostle. Yeah, he was, because the Bible says in Acts chapter number 1 or 2, that after he had died and before they went out of the day of Pentecost, they, they said, we have to pick somebody else. We have to replace Judas because we need another, we need a 12th apostle. And they picked another guy. So yeah, he was a disciple. The narrator of the Bible is calling him a disciple. The narrator of the Bible is saying, out of all the disciples that Jesus had, of all the people that followed his teachings, he picked 12 of them and named them apostles. The Bible says that Judas Iscariot was an apostle, and the Bible says that he was a devil from the beginning. He was never, ever saved. Once you get saved, you can never lose your salvation. If he would have ever been saved, he would have been saved forever. They say, you know, that's, that's, that's what happened to him. Now, number, so number one is it, 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 it messes up the purpose of why we're going out. The purpose of why we go out soul winning is to get people saved. Okay, that's the, that's the main purpose is that we're going out, knocking on doors, getting people saved. On top of that, we're also trying to get people to come to church and live for God. But when we go out, I tell this to people all the time. I told it to the lady I talked to yesterday. Look, I give out a bunch of these all the time. People always throw them away. You know, I mean, I give out tons of these. I'm all over the place with them. But, you know, the reason, the main reason why we're out here is because the fact of the matter is I'll probably never see you again. Let me ask you a question. If you die today, are you 100% sure that you go to heaven? Boom. That's why the main reason why we go out, we call it soul winning. We're not going out on visitation. We're not going out there trying to bring a bunch of people. That's not our main purpose. Our main purpose is to preach the gospel because that's what the Bible has commanded us to do. The byproduct of preaching the gospel is getting people to come in and that they can come in here and learn and teach all nations and we can baptize them. But the main focus is to go out and get people saved. Now, the NIV also says disciples in Matthew 28 because the NIV teaches another gospel. You can you can twist verses in the King James Bible to like crop up like a workspace salvation, but you can't just, there's no verse in the, in the King James Bible where it says that you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Or you need to make Jesus, like, you need to, like, do good works to get to heaven. There's not one verse, not one. If that's 10, verse number 9, the Bible says in the King James, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So right there it says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Okay? That just means if you call out to the Lord. And shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now listen to the NIV. It says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The NIV teaches, and it's got a couple other verses I won't go to. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. The Bible teaches, the NIV teaches, that you need to proclaim that Jesus is Lord. And that's where they get this, this doctrine of making Jesus the Lord of your life, Lordship, salvation. Lordship salvation is the teaching that says that if you really got saved, you'll do works. Well, Romans 4, 5 says, But unto him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. It's the faith. It's the faith that you have at salvation. That's what accounts for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. So if there's a man with no works at all, the Bible says if he believes, righteousness will be imputed unto him. In the, in the, the NIV and Lordship Salvation, they teach that if you're saved, you will automatically do the works. You will automatically start living for God. And now what this is, and this is a big like John MacArthur type thing where they believe in like, you know, he's a big Lordship Salvationist. Where they, you know, they, believe, they know that the Bible says that you can't lose your salvation. And so what the Lordship Salvation people will say is you can't lose your salvation, but if you stop doing you know, coming to church or whatever the case may be, or you go back to drinking or whatever, then it's evident that you never really were saved. Which is total hogwash, is total garbage. Because if you had to give up sins in your life to be saved, I mean, where does that end? We were talking about that this morning. You know, I mean, if somebody had to repent of all their sins, or if somebody had to, 
You know, if you had to, start, if you had to start showing all this fruit in your life as far as like doing good things that like prove that you're saved, where does that end? Most people, there's a lot of things that are in the Bible that most people, especially new salvation people, new, newly saved people, they don't even know is wrong. You know, they're doing things. So what that means, like, let's see what saying. The Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. So if that guy really gets saved, does that mean that he's automatically going to go out and get a haircut? I mean, I've known all sorts of guys that had long hair that were absolutely saved. You know, I mean, where does it end? I mean, does it, I mean, where, at what point does it say, well, now, if, you know, if you really were saved, then you're going to stop doing this. And there's no clear-cut answer on that. It depends on what pastor you talk to. Why? Because it's not a doctrine of the Bible. If there were sins that you had to repent of, or if there were works that you had to do to show that you were actually saved, the Bible would let us know what those things were. So that way we could mark out who really got saved and who didn't. If the Bible said that you needed to turn from some sins to be saved, it would tell us these are the sins that you need to turn from. But it doesn't say that because it's not a doctrine that's found in the Bible. It's found in the NIV. Look at 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18. For us, in a, the King James says, in, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved, it is the power of God. In the NIV it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to them who are perishing, but unto us which are being saved, it is the power of God. So right there, it's making going to hell and being being lost like this process. And it's also making being saved a process. Go to Colossians chapter number 2. Actually, go to Ephesians chapter number 2. I'll read you Colossians 2. It's kind of a parallel. So it's saying that, that being saved and salvation is like a long process. That like, let's say I preach the gospel to you, Alberto, and you receive it. From now until the day you die, you're being saved. Which means, like, we're going to find out if you can really, you know, like I pretty much worry I'm preparing. You better prepare good, buddy, because <laughs> if you don't endure until the end and do everything that I say, you're going to burn in hell. Because you don't live up to the mark that I give if you don't get rid of the sins in your life that I've gotten rid of. Because that's what all this repent of your sins type of yeah. crap is anyway. It always goes to whatever that pastor gave up in his life. You know, I've heard it, I've heard before, you know, you don't, you know, I don't know how it was for you when you got saved, but when I got saved, my life flipped around. You know, I've talked to a pastor. I know a pastor that has like two or three different uh, like testimonies of salvation. And the reason why is because he was, I believe this, I believe he's absolutely saved. I believe he got saved by the first guy that he talked to because the guy told him it was by faith alone. But what happens is you don't go to a good church and you get filled with all this repentant or sins type garbage. And you start thinking back later on in life as you start learning the Bible and growing in the Lord. You start thinking, man. You know, if we have to repent of our sins, I had no idea all the stuff, all the sinful stuff. I was still living in sin after I got saved. Maybe I never really got saved. And so they get saved again and again and again. And so when he first got saved, not a lot happened. He went to church. He kind of did some things, you know, because he was in the military. So he went to, like, the military church there, and I think it was in uh, Alabama or somewhere around there. And then later on, he ended up, you know, this, that, and then. He, he, he got caught because there, sometimes when you're in a place, there's like no churches you can go to in certain areas. And so he ended up going to Church of Christ for like a couple months. And he always talks about how like he covered his bases because he was raised a Catholic. He was baptized a Catholic. Then he got baptized by a Baptist. Then he got baptized by a Church of Christ. Then he got baptized by a Baptist. He's like, I got, I got my bases covered, brother. You know? He always jokes around. It's not that funny. But I mean, it's, and, you, know, and, and, you know, that guy got saved the first time. And then the last time that he got saved, when he, if you try to pin down when did you get saved, he'll say, well, I'm, I, you know, I think it was the first time, but it could have been the second time. And the reason why he points to the last time that he got saved, the second time, is because that's when things started really changing in his life. Okay? You know, I didn't go to church for like five years after I got saved. Okay? I'm telling you what, I always knew I was saved. Not based upon my works, because I was told that it was based upon my faith. I trusted in the Word of God. Now... The Bible doesn't teach that if you're unsaved, you're perishing in your sins. It doesn't teach that if you are saved, you're, you know, you are, it's a process of being saved. The Bible teaches if you're not saved, you're already dead. It's done. And the Bible says if you are saved, you'll, you're already saved. Now in Colossians 2.13, And you, being dead in your sins, and of the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you, of all your trans trespasses. Look at Ephesians 2 verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead. It doesn't say who was dying. It says who was dead in trespasses and sins. Look at verse number 5. 
Even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us together with Christ by grace are you saved. Go to John chapter number 5. John chapter number 5. Salvation is not a process. It's always been a thing where it's like, you know, I mean, you the moment you get saved, you get eternal life and you have it forever. Now look at this. This is like the triumph verse. This is right here. This is a great verse that I like to use for eternal security. You know, you know, whether you know that you're saved or not, well, you're not going to sure you have to endure to the end. No. John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, to have the everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So the Bible says once you get eternal life or everlasting life, at that moment you become passed from death unto life. You're not being saved. It's not a process. It's, a, it's in a moment. The Bible says in John 3, 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Go to Acts chapter number 7. Acts chapter number 7. It says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. It's already on them. They're not dying in their sins. They're already dead. They're already... There'd be, if, you could, if you were being saved, or you were perishing, it means that there'd be like this weird gray area middle to where, like, you know, I mean, if, if you had to do works to go to heaven, I mean, let's say that there was like a level of works that you had to do. And let's, let's use like this, okay? Let's say at this point, boom, you're saved. But let's say you're like, you're hovering around. I mean, like, you know, at what point where you're like, you're doing enough, and then you're not doing enough, and then you're doing enough, and then you're not doing enough, you know, and then you die at the wrong moment, right? Then you go under that little mark, you know? You know, at what point would it be? How long do you have to stay above that mark? You say, what if you really, I've seen a lot of people get on fire for the Lord, and they clean up their life for like a month, and then they fall out of church, you know, they, you know, they, then they're gone forever. Number, uh, so the, the devil is attacking the gospel. He's attacking the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, Acts 7, 59, the Bible says, And they stone Stephen, calling upon God, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So when he called upon God, what name did he call God? He called him Jesus. Because Jesus is the name of God. Every time I preach the gospel to somebody, this is the verse that I go to. I, I do it every time. In that verse where it said, Romans 10, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, that means you have to believe Jesus is God. That he's the Lord. That he's God. And I always, you know, I always tell people, especially in this day and age, a lot of movies out there, you know, whether he's a good teacher, whether he's a, you know, whatever, let me show you what the Bible says, because your faith has to be in the Word of God, not just based upon my opinion. Right there, when I mean, he's calling upon God, he's saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Listen to the NIV. It says, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. It, look at your Bible. Look at this. It says, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. What part is missing? The part where it says he's calling upon God. And the King James is very clear that Jesus Christ is God. In 1 Timothy chapter number 3, go to Revelation chapter number 1. Revelation 1. 1 Timothy 3.16, the Bible says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. The NIV says, Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body and vindicated in the spirit. So that can still be applicable to Jesus Christ. He obviously appeared in the body. But it's not saying God was manifest in the flesh. It just wants to take, you know, we're going to talk about attacking soul winning. Attacking the gospel. Taking away the tools that you have to go out and preach the gospel effectively to people and to show them who Jesus Christ was and why they have to believe him and why you're even supposed to go out in the first place. The NIV is just demolishes it. It's not, they're not the same. Different translations, easier to understand. They're saying totally different things. It's very subtle in a lot of them, and a lot of them it's not subtle, it's, it's real flagrant. Now look at verse number 11. It says, this is Jesus speaking. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto the Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, and the Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And the NIV, look down to King James, verse 11. It says, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it into the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. What is it missing? Where he says, I am the Alpha 
and the Omega. It says in another place, another part of chapter number 1-2, the NIV takes out where he says the, the Alpha and the Omega. In Micah 5-2 where it says Jesus Christ was from old, from everlasting, it takes away that in the, the NIV. It says that he's from, you know, his, you know, his, you know, I can't quite quote it, so I'm not going to quote it. His, he has an origin. It says that he has an origin. His beginnings are from some, some. Jesus Christ had no beginning. He had yeah. no end. Right. No, without father, without mother, without descent, made like unto the Son of God, a bride of the priest, continually. Now go back to uh, Psalm chapter number 12. Psalm chapter number 12. Takes away about the blood of Christ. Colossians 1.14. Whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And the NIV says, whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. It takes away. The word blood is taken out of the NIV like a, a whole bunch of times. I don't know how many, but it's, I can't remember offhand. I didn't write it down or, or print it out. But it's taken a lot. Now... Psalm 12, verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect. Actually, Psalm 19. I'm sorry, Psalm 19. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So we can see right there that the word of God is the one that converts the soul. It's the word of God that takes the testimony of the Lord that is sure, making wise the simple. The NIV is not the Word of God. The Bible says it's obvious we need the Word of God to be saved. We believe it's the King James Bible. The NIV, you can't, nobody can be saved off the NIV. Because the NIV is a corruptible seed. It's completely different than the King James. They can't both be right. It's either one or the other or it's neither one. They can't both be the Word of God. It's, there's just no way. And there's so many other things wrong with the NIV. I could preach about it until kingdom come and you know we will. We'll be preaching about it. Because it's very important that we know that the King James Bible is the Word of God and all these other perversions. In closing, I'm going to say this. I could see how somebody could pick up an NIV and not go out and preach the gospel because it's not in there. They couldn't go out and have the verses that are effectively teaching that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. That, that we need to go out there and preach the gospel to every creature. We need to go out there and it's the blood of Christ that saves. Those verses aren't in the NIV, but guess what, folks? We don't have an NIV. We have a King James Bible. Amen. We have no excuses why we should not be going out there and preaching the gospel to every creature. Like I said this morning, we have too much wishy-washy Christianity. We need people that, I mean, the mission of this church is to go out and preach the gospel and to go out and talk to people and to create dialogue and to set a time aside where we go out and get as many, and preach the gospel to as many people as we can. That's what he said to do. He said, go out and preach the gospel to every creature. That's our job. A couple of weeks ago, last week, they came back with so many. They said, we didn't have anybody saved. We know like two whole streets. We didn't get anybody saved. We felt like it was a disappointing day. It makes no difference whether they get saved or not. Your job is to preach the gospel. Did you preach the gospel? Were you knocking on the doors? Were you talking to people? Yes. Well, you did your job. You, you're not doing your job when you're not going out there preaching the gospel. We need to be a Christianity, a church that realizes that our mission is to go out there and get people saved. We have to make it a priority. We have no excuse. We can't stand in front of God and say, you can't stand in front of God. I can't stand in front of God and say, and end my life without ever going so many, without ever winning someone to Christ and say, I didn't have the tools that I needed. The Bible says, how shall they preach except they be sent? I'm telling you, I'm sending you out to go out and do it. I'm, giving, I'm showing you the verses in the Bible. There's other people in this church, if you don't know how to do it, you can go with them for months. I went and wrestled silent partner for months before I ever even spoke up and said anything to anybody. You have no excuse why you're disobeying God by not going soul Amen. winning. We need consistent soul winners that are going out all the time. At, you know, I would say this. I mean, start off at least a couple times a month, but you need to be going out. You need to develop it where you're not just going soul winning, but you are a soul winner. But it starts with baby steps, silent partner, going soul winning, knocking on doors, you can grow that and develop that into being a day-to-day -day witness for the Lord. I mean, most of the people that I get saved aren't even from door-to-door -door soul winning. It's literally me jumping out of the truck or it's me talking to people here and there. It's because I have a, I, I, I want to I wanna get people saved. That's my goal in life is to get as many people into heaven as I possibly can. That's one, not the only goal, but it's definitely the main goal. If that's not the main goal for you... You need to get it right, and you need to figure a way out to go out soul winning because that's, that's the purpose. That's the Great Commission. The Great Commission is three parts. It's to go out there, get them saved, get them baptized, and then teach them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And honestly, the easiest part is to get them saved.
It's hard to get somebody here. It's harder to get somebody that's here to get baptized. But I'm telling you what, you say, well, I don't know how to do all that. You get in here, I'll talk to them. Somebody else will talk to them. We'll get them baptized. We'll teach them the Word of God. I'll do follow-up, and I'll follow up with them. I'm not afraid of that word follow-up. I'll go talk to people that come. Yeah, you have followed up with people that have visited here? I followed up with pretty much everybody that's visited here. You say, well, did they all come back? No, but God looks up down from heaven, and he knows that what we're doing here, that we care about these people. And you know, you know, if you don't know how to do that, or you don't want to do that, that's fine. Leave it to someone else to do it. But you can't get away from the fact that we're commanded to go out and preach the word of God. We have the tools to do it. We have the word of God. Let's just be going out there. Let's be the sower. You know, I'll leave you with this. The sower that sowed the word, he, let's, let's a guy that's sowing on these, on these grounds. He's just throwing out the seed. He can see that he was sowing on rocky ground. He can see that he was stoning, sowing on thorny and stony ground and good ground. He could have took all of his seed and just dumped it on the good ground, but he didn't. He just sowed it everywhere. He just threw it out there. As the, as, that's exactly what we're supposed to do. Is we should not base, you know, we should not look and say, well, you know, this neighborhood doesn't look bad, doesn't look very good, or these people don't look very good. I'm not going to talk to them because they don't look good people and get saved. Our job is just to preach the gospel to every creature. Give it right. to the gospel to as many people as we can. Let the chips fall where they may. Even if you go out and you don't get anybody saved, you still, if we had five people, let's say I went out today and had five people saved, okay? And let's say I went out for two hours and you went out for five hours and you got no people saved, we're both just as successful. I believe that because we're both just doing what we're told. You know, I'm not doing, the days that I get people saved, I'm not doing anything more than the days that I'm not getting people saved. I'm doing the same exact thing. Some days you get people saved, some days you don't. Let's pray. Lord, thank you.